Next, a friendly and safe new source of oil for the U.S. or an environmental disaster waiting to happen. The tar sands of Alberta in western Canada are today considered one of the largest oil reserves in the world, a source of crude petroleum known as bitumen. But the extraction of oil there has come with concerns about the environmental impact. And now those concerns have exploded with a plan by the Calgary-based company TransCanada to build a massive pipeline to carry that crude oil deep into the U.S. The proposed Keystone XL pipeline would run 1,700 miles through Montana, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, and Oklahoma on its way to refineries in Texas. It's projected to cost $7 billion and carry an estimated 800,000 barrels of oil a day. The plan has galvanized a growing opposition from those who fear it would increase greenhouse gas emissions as well as the prospects of leaks and spills in environmentally sensitive areas. Activists are now in the midst of a two-week protest at the White House. Some 400 have been arrested so far. On Friday, they were dealt a blow by the U.S. State Department, which released a report finding the pipeline project will present no significant environmental problems. A final decision to allow or reject the pipeline will come from Secretary of State Clinton and ultimately President Obama. It's expected by the end of the year. And we have our own debate on the Keystone Pipeline project now with Robert Bryce, senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and author of Power Hungry, The Myths of Green Energy and the Real Fuels of the Future, and Bill McKibben, an environmentalist, author, and organizer of the ongoing protests in Washington this week. Bill McKibben, why these protests? What, what, what are the, what's the key problems you see with this project? You know, this has turned into the biggest civil disobedience action in the environmental movement in a generation. And the reason is that this is this tar sands in Alberta is a big deal. It's the second largest pool of carbon on Earth after the oil fields of Saudi Arabia. Jim Hansen of NASA, who was arrested today, are the, really the world's foremost climate scientist, said as he was uh, speaking this morning, said, if we go ahead and begin tapping these unconventional energy sources of which the tar sands are the biggest example, it is, and here I quote, essentially game over for the climate. Since for once, Obama can stop a project without having Congress in the way, this has become the focal point. And these arrests have actually now over 500 people. The numbers are just growing and growing day after day. All right, we'll go into some of the details. But first, as a general sure. proposition, you support this. Why do, why do you think it should go through? I do. Well, uh, Jeff, I, I, you know, I'm, I appreciate Bill McKibben's passion on the issue. I understand his position. But my position is very simple. I'm for cheap, abundant, reliable energy, particularly now in the U.S. when we have over 45 million Americans on food stamps. We have more than 9 million unemployed. The actual un unemployed or underemployed number is probably twice that number. We need cheap, abundant, reliable energy. And this project will in particular provide abundant and reliable energy. Um, this, the, tar, the oil sands in, in Canada have over 100 billion barrels of oil uh, in them. Um, and we need it now, given particularly because we want North American energy production, better, better off it's, if it's domestic. But we've been relying on Mexico and Canada for many years. Over the last decade, Mexico's oil production has fallen by 600,000 barrels, and Canada's has risen by more than 600,000 barrels. I'd like that. We need that reliable energy production as close to home as we can. And if we can buy it from friends and allies, that's even better. All right. So that, 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 that's the argument. The U.S. needs the oil. Why not get it from a friend rather than be more dependent elsewhere? and especially if it sure. provides U.S. jobs. That's, that's the argument we hear for it. Uh, you know, uh, there's got to be a better way to deal with our food stamp problem, especially when, as we're now beginning to see, after a year of the most violent and extreme weather we've ever recorded around the planet, after the uh, price of food has gone up around the world 80% because we're missing harvest after harvest with drought and with flood, we've got to take global warming completely seriously. I understand the realism that Robert brings to this, but there is a deeper realism at work here. And if we do not get to work on climate change now, and this has become the proxy fight for climate change in the Obama administration. This is a guy who, when he, the night he was nominated, said, in my presidency, the rise of the oceans will begin to slow and the planet will begin to heal. Congress has kept him from keeping many of those promises, but this time he can't. But in, in the State Department report, if I, read, if I understand this rightly, they're saying 
the extraction is going to happen anyway. That's, and the greenhouse gas emissions. That's what's are, so interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, because the Canadians aren't saying that. I mean, they don't. They have to have Alberta's a long way from anywhere. They have to have a pipeline to get it out. The one they're trying to build west <coughs> to the Pacific has been completely blocked for years by Indian tribes in Canada who have a lot of legal power. The energy minister of Alberta said a couple of weeks ago, "If we don't get this Keystone pipeline, we're going to be landlocked in oil." And that's what we need. Uh, it's not that we're going to necessarily keep it in the ground forever by blocking this pipeline, but sooner or later the world is going to come to its senses about climate change, and therefore preventing it for five or ten years is a pretty good thing. Now, one issue is the extraction. Oh, sure. go ahead. Well, I, I, let me talk about the, yeah. the CO2. And, and again, I respect Bill's position, but let's look at the numbers. Over the last decade, during which we've heard, and, and Bill has been in on the forefront of this fight, and, and Al Gore has been in the forefront talking about the need for CO2 limits, uh, CO2 taxation, et cetera. And what have we had? We've had meetings in Copenhagen. We've had meetings in Cancun. We'll have a meeting in Durban, South Africa later this year. But what has ho happened over this last decade where we've had an unprecedented amount of media coverage and discussions <coughs> about CO2 taxation, et cetera, global energy consumption has gone up 27% and global uh, carbon dioxide emissions have gone up 28.5%. During that same decade, U.S. CO2 uh, uh, emissions have fallen by 1.7%. The issue now is not the U.S., it's the rest of the world, where people are desperate for electricity, they're desperate for gasoline, they're desperate for diesel fuel. It's countries like Vietnam, which has had the biggest percentage growth in CO2 emissions of any country on the planet. Vietnam, China, India, Malaysia, it's uh, Indonesia, Brazil, Pakistan, all around the world. So, uh, so you mean it'll go somewhere else? If, if it, it doesn't come to the U.S., it is going to find its way to the market. Why? Mm -hmm. Because we have a billion motor vehicles on the planet and people want mobility. So uh, again, my, my thesis is cheap, abundant, reliable, and it, this pipeline is a, a key part of that. Go ahead. If it's going somewhere, it could come well, here. It's, it could come it's, here more safely. Than it go. may go someplace someday. Yeah. Yeah. And Robert's absolutely right. We've lost the battle for the last 10 years to do anything about seriously regulating greenhouse gases. That's because the oil industry and the fossil fuel industry have won all those fights. And no surprise, they have more money than any industry on Earth. That's why we've been working hard to find a different currency to work in. For the last two weeks, it's been our bodies here in Washington, and it's beginning to make a difference. This tide is beginning to turn at least here. And the one thing I, I would say, since I do a lot of work around the world on this, look, places like Vietnam are using more energy, but let's not let America off the hook as not a part of this problem. Your average Vietnamese uses uh, a tiny fraction of the amount of energy your average American does. And, and, and We've I'm got to take care of our... The real example, the real place to look at here for me, it's more like this. 25 years ago, we figured out that Brazil had a unique biological treasure, the rainforest. They were, and we asked them to preserve it, and they've done a pretty good job, you know. They've uh, slowed deforestation. They've reduced carbon emissions more than any country on Earth. It turns out North America has a unique geological formation, this huge pool of tar sands. It's not too much to ask us to forego that and to instead take this opportunity to really begin well, bending well, the curve. Well, let's talk about Brazil then, if you don't mind, because mm. what's happened in Brazil over the last decade, oil, oil production in Brazil has grown faster perhaps than any other country on the planet. Their offshore oil industry, uh, led by Petrobras, <coughs> their national oil company, is um, they're among the best in the world at offshore drilling, are now producing on the order of 2.3 million barrels a day. So uh, this idea that somehow we're going to keep <coughs> this carbon in the ground, again, uh, the, 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 the premium for, for uh, better lives around the world, among the billions that live in energy poverty, is too great. Right, let me ask you about one other. We're sure. talking about the emissions aspect to this. Sure. But the other thing people wonder about is the pipeline yeah. itself, the, the possibility of leaks and spills. We just saw this sure. in Yellowstone River <clears throat> this summer. And we so saw how them, concerned. And, and we saw the Macondo blowout last summer. Right. Look, every energy source, every power source, exacts a toll on the environment. Uh, there is no such thing as a free lunch well, in energy or anything else. So which is, really is good. there a possibility of, of leaks and, and, and damage? Of course. But we have two million miles of natural gas pipeline in this country. The, the, the cheapest, most effective, safest way for transportation of natural gas and oil is with pipelines. The precursor pipeline to this one, a much smaller one, in its first year of operations managed to spring 12 leaks. Okay, um, For some reason, 
we're running this particular pipeline over the Oglala Aquifer, the biggest source of fresh water uh, in the middle of our continent. I mean, the desire to prevent a terrestrial BP spill is an important part of this, too. Well, but but even, if that, even if it gets there safely to Texas, okay, mm -hmm. that's just that much more oil to spill into the atmosphere. This thing is dirty at every turn, and it's why. It's why, finally, for the first time in a long time, there are people, there are people going to jail right now to try and stop it. Please, sure. please. Well, uh, let me just turn back to the CO2 emissions because uh, Bill and I were talking about this just a, a little bit ago. It, it, I mentioned global CO2 emissions have risen by 28.5% in the last decade. Well, <clears throat> uh, that's 7.3 billion tons per year. You could zero out U.S. CO2 emissions of 6.1 billion tons, and global CO2 emissions on an annual basis still would have increased. The problem is, again, uh, the U.S., why do we live well? Why do we have high CO2 emissions? Because we use a lot of energy. Let me just ask you briefly, because you're wearing your Obama 08 <laughs> button there. You clearly supported him last time around, That's but right. you've set this up as a major challenge to him. What people are saying outside the White House is we need to be reminded of why we were so enthusiastic four years ago. When I was in jail in central cell block the other day, someone who was lying there on the cot next to me said, the last time I was this uncomfortable, I was on a church basement waiting to go knock on doors for Obama. I want to remember why it was that I was that fired up. All right. Bill McKibben, Robert Bryce, thank you both very much. Thanks, Jeff.